And then it shall be free. What's up, everybody? It's Eon Cure, and welcome to part two of my Metal Gear Solid 5 E3 2015 trailer analysis. In this video, I'll be making a couple of corrections as well as focusing on one topic that I completely forgot to talk about in part one. The references that the trailer makes to George Orwell's novel, 1984. It's a very important book that further highlights various narrative aspects of Phantom Pain. Now, before you watch this video, I highly recommend you watch part one of the analysis as I'll be referencing that quite a bit. Seriously, if you haven't done so yet, please watch part one, or this video won't have the same impact. Anyway, there is a lot to talk about, so without further ado, let's dive right into it. I would like to begin by taking a look at this scene, in which you will find this rod-shaped piece of equipment. In my previous video, I thought that this might be some sort of grenade because of the grenade-like symbol engraved on it, but a lot of people pointed out that this is most likely some kind of e-cigar, most likely the Phantom Cigar. I can pretty much confirm this is true after taking a closer look at the Phantom Cigar that Snake uses in previous footage. Notice how the proportions and the tips are identical. This kind of tip is also very common among real-life e-cigars. Next, I would like to take a look at this scene from the short E3 2015 trailer, in which we see Big Boss holding three primary weapons. I was a little confused in my previous analysis because Snake should only be able to hold two weapons, but then a couple of you pointed out that in Metal Gear or Solid 5 you can steal weapons from enemies. When you do so, you will have three weapons, one on the hip, one on the back, and one equipped. So the weapon that Snake is holding in his hands in this scene might have been stolen from an enemy soldier. Moving on, I would like to talk about the female skull's eye patch. In part one of my analysis, I pointed out how similar its design is to Big Boss's eye patch, featuring the same three strap design and how the patch itself has a very similar shape. So I contemplated the possibility of Mother Base possibly borrowing this technology at one point to give Big Boss a cybernetic eye patch very similar to the Solid Eye. But then a lot of you pointed out that unlike Solid Snake, Big Boss doesn't have an eye, making such an idea pointless. I guess I wasn't clear on what I meant, so here's my clarification. What I intended to convey was the possibility that this technology could perhaps be used to give Big Boss a cybernetic or prosthetic eye that can return vision on his damaged right eye. Big Boss has already been given an awesome cybernetic arm to replace his left arm, so who's to say that the same won't happen for his long-lost right eye? And perhaps this cybernetic eye patch would also feature various functionalities like infrared vision or something, in a similar fashion to the solid eye. Again, this is just me speculating and contemplating possibilities. I'm not saying this is confirmed or likely even. Last but not least, before getting into 1984, I would like to take a look at Young Mantis here, or as he's known in Phantom Pain, Treti Rebionok. Something that I forgot to mention was the translation of the Russian characters found on his straitjacket. According to various sources, this translates to Leningrad University of Parapsychology. Leningrad State University was actually a real-life school in the Soviet Union, but its name was changed to St. Petersburg State University after the Soviet Union collapsed. The university is currently one of the oldest and largest in Russian history. Also derived from real life is parapsychology, which in our modern day and age is considered a pseudoscience that studies paranormal or psychic phenomena. Believe it or not, there was actually a surge in this field during the 70s and 80s, and among the countries researching this field was the Soviet Union. And according to website encyclopedia.com, the one who pioneered parapsychology in the Soviet Union was a man named Vasiliev, who helped establish the first parapsychology laboratory in Leningrad. So yeah, all of these Soviet Union-related facts that tie into the Russian characters on Treti's jacket is further confirmation that this is indeed Psychomantis, who is known to be Russian. And it looks like his backstory will deal a lot with a combination of real-life history and pseudo-history involving the study of parapsychology at Leningrad. I also mentioned in a previous video that Treti Rebionok is Russian for third child. 
While I can't say for sure if this is his real name or code name, the translation still has a very interesting implication. I talked in my previous analysis about how it's possible that all of MGS1's six high-ranking members of Foxhound will make an appearance in Phantom Pain, since they have all pretty much been born by 1984, three of whom have already been confirmed, Liquid, Mantis, and Ocelot. Now, something to remember is that another name for these six members of Foxhound is the Sons of Big Boss. See where I'm going with this? Third Child, Sons of Big Boss? What if Third Child alludes to how Mantis will become a member of the Sons of Big Boss in the future? And what if Phantom Pain features a first child, a second child, a fourth child, a fifth child, and a sixth child, each representing the rest of the members of the Sons of Big Boss? The first child would obviously have to be Liquid, with him being the leader of the group and all, and I would assume that Ocelot would have to be the second. But the rest are all up in the air. But basically the theory is that Third Child may allude to Mantis becoming the third member of the Sons of Big Boss, and that this could possibly hint at the rest of the Sons or Children being featured in the game as well, albeit in their much younger selves. Food for thought. Alright, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about George Orwell's 1984, which seems to be a big inspiration behind various plot elements of Phantom Pain and the series in general. Here are the basics of the novel's story. The story follows the life of a man named Winston Smith, an inhabitant of Airstrip 1, once known as England, in the fictional nation of Oceania, which rules over most of the world in Orwell's fictional setting. Oceania is said to be led by an elusive entity known as Big Brother, and it is ruled by a group known simply as the Party. The Party rules with an iron fist through its four ministries, the Ministry of Peace, the Ministry of Plenty, the Ministry of Love, and the Ministry of Truth all named with the exact opposite of their intended purpose. The Ministry of Peace deals with military, locking the nation in a constant state of conflict and war with the other two remaining nations, Eurasia and East Asia, to ensure that all surplus resources are spent and used to keep citizens in lives of constant hardship, forcing them to focus on basic survival, thereby preventing them from contemplating or comprehending the true nature of their society. The Ministry of Plenty deals with economic affairs, with its main goal being to maintain a state of perpetual poverty and starvation, as this weakens Oceania citizens, thereby making them easier to rule. The Ministry of Love deals with law, order, and loyalty, which is enforced through fear and means such as torture and brainwashing. Finally, the Ministry of Truth deals with history, media, entertainment, education, art, and even language, reshaping them for propaganda, for their own agenda, and to limit expression. This ministry also serves to spread lies about Oceania, convincing people that there is no war, that it's all peaceful, that the economy is booming, and that there is equality all around. Through these four ministries, the party maintains absolute control over its people, oppressing free thought and expression of individuality. The party's members can be categorized into two classes, the inner party and the outer party. The inner party is the political class of Oceania, comprised of the top 2%, so about 6 million out of Oceania's 300 million people population. Members of the inner party are rich, powerful, and influential, and even amongst them, only a select few truly rule over Oceania in true oligarchical fashion. The members of the inner party aren't born into it like royalty or anything of the sort. Instead, they are selected at a young age based on results from a series of tests. Only a select few that the party approve and deem least likely to rebel and most likely to be loyal make it, regardless of race or bloodline. The inner party is personified by Big Brother, the alleged leader of Oceania, although whether he actually exists as a physical entity or whether he was made up by the party as an icon is never made clear. Then we have the Outer Party, which is the middle class of Oceania, comprised of 13% of the population, so about 39 million of the 300 million population. They are bureaucrats who do most of the work for the party, the Inner Party's political foot soldiers, so to speak, serving as low-ranking members. Members of the Outer Party are kept under close surveillance and supervision by members of the Inner Party through telescreens, TVs with surveillance cameras in them, and Thought Police, a secret police force that uncover and punish any thoughts or actions against the party, called Thought Crime in the novel, to ensure that their actions and thoughts serve the best interest of the party. Finally, there are the proles who make up the rest of the population. While they are considered citizens of Oceania, they are not considered members of the party. 
To the party, they are comparable to animals whose sole purpose is to work and breed. They are low-class citizens who receive little education, do manual labor for work, live in poverty, and whose average life expectancy is 60 years. At the same time, they are given enough basic resources, needs, and freedom to avoid giving them any reason for rebellion. They are deprived of enough to make them weak and easy to rule, but given enough to keep them satisfied and happy. As long as the proles don't cause any problems or begin organizing politically, they are left alone to enjoy personal freedoms as well as the basic and simple pleasures of life. With the proles having little reason to instigate rebellion, the party surveillance and supervision on them is kept to a bare minimum, with only the occasional thought police here and there keeping an eye out for any citizen who may cause trouble. This is in stark contrast to members of the inner party and the outer party, who as cogs of the machine are given many restrictions when it comes to personal freedoms and pleasures of life. For example, whereas proles can enjoy liberal sex, members of the party are only allowed to engage in sexual activity for procreation, while sex for pleasure is severely punished. This is just one of many examples. One could argue that proles are the best class to be a part of, while they may never experience the luxuries and benefits that members of the inner party get to enjoy, at least they get to live the most average and humane lives. Outer party members, on the other hand, get the worst of both worlds. They don't get to enjoy the luxuries of the inner party, nor the simple pleasures of life of the proles. Our protagonist, Winston Smith himself, is a member of the outer party, working as a clerk in the records department of the Ministry of Truth. I don't want to delve too deeply into the exact details of the narrative, since it's the novel's concepts that are most relevant to this analysis. But in short, Winston Smith develops doubts and frustrations about the party and the society he lives in, which are thoughts considered a crime under the party's rule, a concept known as thought crime. So he attempts to fight back by secretly joining a resistance group known as the Brotherhood. But he gets tricked in the process, ends up getting busted by the party, and he is then tortured and brainwashed to accept the party in its entirety and to love Big Brother. Pretty grim stuff, not a happy ending. Now, if you are a fan of Metal Gear, then you may already see some of the parallels here. Big Brother is very reminiscent of Zero, or Cypher as he's known sometimes, both of which are enigmatic and elusive figures who come to rule most of the world. Then we have the Party, which can be associated with the Patriots, both of which are organizations that eventually come to have absolute control over the world by regulating war, economy, politics, information, and people. The members of the Patriots are basically the inner party, while the Patriots' puppets, among them being the various branches of government it controls, could be said to be the outer party, political foot soldiers who are forced or manipulated to do their ruler's bidding and to aid in fulfilling their ruler's vision of an ideal world. Finally, the proles could very well represent the citizens that inhabit the world of Metal Gear, who also make up for most of the population and who also are either ignorant or choose to ignore the forces that are controlling them behind the scenes. So the allusions to the concepts of 1984 aren't just new to Phantom Pain, they have in some way, shape or form been seen in other games as well. Now when it comes to Phantom Pain, the most significant concept to focus on is language. Phantom Pain establishes that language is a vital part of our identity, and it hints at Zero possibly planning to use language to unite the world and fulfill his deluded version of the boss's vision of the world, all of which I talked about in part one of my analysis. Again, check it out if you haven't done so yet. Back then, I was a little confused as to how language could play any part in Zero's plan to unify and control the world under one rule, but after doing some research on George Orwell's 1984, I'm beginning to get some ideas. As it turns out, language also plays a major part in how Oceania's government rules its people. Part of the Ministry of Truth's job is to create and implement a new language system called Newspeak. It basically takes regular English, known as Old Speak in the novel, and drastically reduces or changes its vocabulary to limit freedom of thought and the capacity for expression. For example, one thing that Newspeak does is remove as many synonyms and antonyms as possible to eliminate shades of meaning from its language, thereby only leaving simple black and white concepts. So words related to anything positive like good, great, excellent, fantastic, magnificent, splendid, you name it, are stripped to simply good, plus good, or double plus good. Words related to anything negative, like bad, terrible, evil, etc., 
are bogged down to the words ungood, plus ungood, or double plus ungood, and words that breed concepts of defiance like freedom, liberty, rights, justice, etc. aren't just streamlined, they are eliminated altogether. So, let's say you want to express that Big Brother is a sick son of a bitch motherfucker who deserves to rot in hell because he's a dictator with no regards for human rights. In Newspeak, all of that would literally be bogged down to Big Brother is double plus ungood. While this might express some form of dissatisfaction against Big Brother, which by itself would get you punished, tortured, and brainwashed, Due to how the language was designed, you wouldn't be able to explain why, you wouldn't be able to delve into complex thoughts or ideas supporting your beliefs, and you basically wouldn't be able to elaborate further with words or concepts like rights, dictators, sick son of a bitch motherfucker, and rot in hell being non-existent or reduced to ungood in newspeak, it would be impossible to express complex ideas in the same manner that I can now by saying stuff like Big Brother is basically enslaving his citizens and that the inhabitants of Oceania should stand up and fight for their freedom, or whatever. By stripping the English language of redundancy and layers of meaning, the party aims to create a language that can only be used to communicate basic human thoughts and expression, thereby diminishing people's capacity to think of complex concepts like freedom, rights, and anything that would compromise the party's absolute domination. After learning all that, I began to ask myself, what if Zero is going for something similar? Perhaps his intention is to implement some kind of common, simplified language system into the world in order to limit people's ability to think complex concepts or to express themselves in ways that would go against Zero's desire to make the world one. As mentioned in my previous analysis, Code Talker talks about his definition of a ruler, stating that what rulers use to bring people together is language, with the ruler possibly referencing Zero. This is then directly followed by Zero's dialogue on how he plans to make the world one, and in his list of things that will become irrelevant, he omits language, meaning that language won't be irrelevant, perhaps further indicating that language is indeed a key part of his plan. Further evidence can be found in Skullface's dialogue later in the trailer, through which he hints that the Major, referring to Zero, sought a system that used information, words to control the subconscious. What if these words to control the subconscious refer to a simplified language that suppresses subconscious thoughts and feelings in a similar fashion to 1984's Newspeak? And speaking of Skullface, as I mentioned in my previous analysis, it is my belief that his goals are the complete opposite of Zero's. The trailer mentions through Ocelot's dialogue how Skullface believes that the greatest symbiotic parasite the world's ever known isn't microbial, but rather linguistic. He mentions how words are what keep civilization alive, and how freeing the world involves taking men's tongues, aka their language or their words. From the looks of it, whereas Zero wants to use language to control the world and people's subconscious, Skullface seems to want to get rid of language altogether to free the world of what he deems to be an infestation. As he states in one of his dialogue, he will rid the world of infestation, and sans lingua franca, or without common language, the world will be torn asunder and set free. And as I stated in part one of the analysis, there are signs both within the trailer's footage and in the dialogue, which constantly uses words like symbiotic parasite, microbials, and infestation, that Skullface's plan may involve some kind of disease or infection, one that can perhaps deprive people of their words. I also theorized that this infection may possibly play a part in the creation of the skulls, and that it is perhaps the source of Quiet's affliction of being deprived of her words, who I suspect may have been a subject of the Skull's experiment on the account that her powers are very similar to theirs and that she has the same eyeshadow as the female Skulls. And the infection could also possibly be the source of the faded eyes that Kaz, Code Talker, and the African man with the headphone lodged in his throat seem to share. So my theory is that Skullface's goal may perhaps be to use a lesser type of infestation, some kind of custom-made microbial parasite, to eradicate what he believes to be the greatest infestation of them all, linguistic. So bottom line for my theory, maybe Zero wants to implement his version of Newspeak as a means to unite the world under one rule and to control it, while Skullface's agenda perhaps lies on the other end of the spectrum saving the world from control and freeing it by getting rid of language altogether through some kind of weaponized microbial parasite or some kind of infection. Yeah, I know, it's really out there, so don't be surprised if I end up being partially or completely wrong when the game comes out. But based on what I saw in the trailer, this is what I can assume. 
One last thing I would like to talk about is the possibility that Big Brother might actually represent Big Boss rather than Zero. The thought sort of came to mind after seeing these posters, which replaces the slogan Big Brother is watching you with Big Boss is watching you. On the one hand, this could just be some kind of clever nod or reference on Kojima's part, but on the other hand, he might also be trying to convey some kind of message after the crazy connections he made with this shot from the trailer and a novel called Lord of the Flies, which I talked all about in part one of my analysis, I'm not taking any chances. Something that I mentioned before is that Big Brother personifies Oceania's inner party, and that regardless of whether he actually exists or not, he is seen and advertised as the leader of Oceania. In his most basic form, Big Brother is the nation's icon. Notice how this falls in line with Major Zero's reason for recruiting Big Boss into the Patriots prior to their falling out. One of Zero's goals was to make Big Boss an icon like the party did with Big Brother. So perhaps Zero in actuality represents one of Oceania's leaders within the inner party, while Big Boss represents the icon that rules and watches over Oceania, Big Brother. Another reason to believe this is that, unlike Big Brother, Zero never was much of a physical presence. As a matter of fact, he went out of his way to hide his existence from the world. This is why he needed Big Boss. He needed him to be a physical entity, presence, and icon to represent the Patriots. You could almost say that Big Boss was to be the Patriots' mascot, in the same manner that, to some degree, Big Brother is Oceania's and the party's mascot. Now, obviously, things didn't work out the way Zero had intended, and Big Boss, who didn't want to be the Patriots icon, eventually broke away from the Patriots, in contrast to Big Brother. But still, the parallel between the slogan found on Mother Base's posters in the E3 2015 trailer and Big Brother's slogan, as well as the two entities' common intended purpose of serving as an icon, could mean that there is some kind of connection between them. If this is the case, then the poster here could perhaps be foreshadowing at a Big Boss that will rule more like a dictator at some point, or something along those lines. Bottom line is that there are two possibilities on who Big Brother represents. On the one hand, he might represent Zero in the sense that they are both enigmatic and elusive leaders of an organization, the party and the patriots respectively, that come to rule the world under one will. On the other hand, he could represent Big Boss in that the trailer references Big Brother's slogan through the posters and in that both Big Boss and Big Brother were meant to serve as icons for their respective organizations. And with that, I would like to end this trailer analysis. Thank you for tuning in. Let us know in the comments below your thoughts on Phantom Pain's references to George Orwell's 1984. Do you think there's a connection between the novel's concept of newspeak and Zero's plan to somehow use language to control the world? Who do you think Big Brother represents, Big Boss or Zero, and what are the implications? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below, and to be further updated on Metal Gear Solid 5, stay tuned right here on Yong Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Yeong out.